enjoy them anyway. The one thing I'd like to mention, uh, all those bloody Tasmanian jokes, although I'm not a member of the club, I live in diagonally right, up, right across Tassie, after seeing what they've done in about two or three years, uh, I reckon the Tassie jokes will calm down. It's a bloody credit to them what come up on those slides. Yeah. It really is. That's in a very short time. Uh, part of this was printed in New Hedeby, but I'll simply just go through each paragraph and then we'll elaborate on it and just ask questions or whatever if you wish. Uh, it's entitled, Take Two Comfrey Leaves and Call Me in the Morning, which is a send-up of the classic medics take two uh, aspirates and call me in the morning syndrome, which happens right now in 1983. It's a broad light look at medieval medicine and it's entitled Wise Advice to Surgeons and Physicians. I'm wearing the garments of a medieval surgeon, about 1100, about 1100. But I am in the service, I'm not one of the poorer ones, there you go. I'm in the service of a great lord, therefore I wear a few fineries so that I match the, uh, I look good to hang around them sort of thing. <laughs> it's easy to say in modern women, isn't it? Right, skull surgery. Requires a trephining drill spun by centrifugal force, bow or hand action. Also a curved blade cranial saw. First remove the hair by flame or shaving. Operate, then seal with pitch, cautery and oil. To trace a fractured skull, pour ink or resin over the patient's bare head, briskly rub off, and the line of damage or depression will show. Well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> no, it really does. Uh, some patients will become insane after this form of treatment. <laughs> Therefore, wisdom is assured by keeping your sword within reach. <laughs> keeping in mind that Bishop Odo was one of the meanest fighting men ever on this earth. A lot so were a lot of the surgeons. This is a If you could excuse me a moment, something's to... One of the problems of transporting things is that they get busted. Right. This works... Just excuse me a sec, I'll try and rig it up. Cut the film late. It's a very special shape for then following up around that whole line and taking a piece about however big out of the skull so you can have a look in. Uh, God knows what they did then. <laughs> but they really knew how to, they were right into this, medieval and Roman were right into this sort of thing. And you see how it's going to work, if it will work, it is busted. But by pulling down on this uh, beam here, in actual fact it causes centrifuge. The weight of this makes it spin. It spins one way and then the other, okay? But you can see the action, it's, it's, I'm afraid it's broken, but you can see how the action works. And it does work very, very well because there's a, a small boring point there, a little piece of metal that bores into the skull. Okay, sorry, that's embarrassing. Uh, eye surgery is of a delicate nature to remove the mist film, which means uh, a cataract. Mist film would have meant cataract, which is a common thing today too, of course. Scrape slowly, and that means with a knife, to one corner of the affected eye. And it's exactly what they do today, except we now have very volatile anaesthetics. So a lot of this, believe it or not, is exactly what they do today. Uh, to mix a suit of ointment, use charcoal, honey, salt, castor oil, copper and alum. <coughs> what they use today, except the honey. Right, copper is was one of the bases of, right? Uh, should the eye become blind, sew the lids together to protect it. Right. No. <laughs> um, well, that's all. Right. Um, with air 
treatment, should the air part from the head <laughs> sew it back on or leave and treat as a wound? Ears serve no real purpose and restrict the placement of helms. <laughs> In pitch battle, if you lose your helm, it allows your opponent an extra appendage to grip. <laughs> Sounds cool, right. What good is this thing hanging off the side of your head? Really? Directional. <laughs> Rear eight, make a concoction of bull's gall and honey. Bull's gall and honey. That was for tipping in the ear to whatever. Uh, tooth care is important. Place potassium or sodium carbonate in a ladle and burn. Remove the residue and instruct the patient to rub on the teeth. Believe it, believe it works. Yeah. Uh, this will remove any stain. So obviously a follow-up to uh, Gail's lecture there and Cynthia's, they were, a lot of them were very proud of their appearance and for those who aren't aware, the Vikings in particular were very uh, vain people. And as Cynthia and Gail mentioned, colourful. So they were into having nice white pepsodent teeth as well. Uh, to fashion a false tooth, carve from an ox bone or use extracted patient's teeth. Pain of the teeth is common and should be treated with a mixture of wine, castor oil and powdered clove bone. Should this fail, use opium. <laughs> And if this is of no avail, remove the offender by cutting the gum, levering, and drawing out with forceps. Uh, now that's not as silly as it sounds for those days, using the actual tooth extracted from the patient. They would clean off the roots and put a metal plate running across from the good tooth, including the removed tooth, and back around the back again. It makes sense. Uh, anesthetics. Uh, of local nature is best served by the use of oil of roses and vinegar for general body pain reduction, <coughs> opium, again, henbane and mandrake, all in equal parts, crushed and held to the patient's nose will alleviate severe pain. To revive the, and to revive the patient from anaesthetic, rub vinegar on the patient's teeth and nostrils. That's a bit suspect. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, burns are of no consequence. <laughs> right, now they wouldn't have had the horrific burns that we have today in both a chemical nature, so that's a passing comment, burns are of no consequence. Simply apply white of egg or take goat stroppings and wheat, crush and burn to dust, add fat and boil, strain and apply. I think you'd be better off with just the white of egg because it is a, a cooling, right? Uh, for lumbago, this can be cured with a mixture of oil, sulphur, vinegar, pitch, and soda, placed on wool and applied, externally of course. Wounds should be cleansed with rose water, white of egg, wine, then sewn with horse hair, linen, silk, human hair, bowstring, thin leather, hemp, or animal sinews. Makes a lot of sense, except for the infect various infections you get off the horse hair and human hair. Um, Burn incense to purify the air, and should fever be evident, remove patient to a cool place. A fountain is ideal. It also makes a lot of sense. Uh, the black ant with the large head. <laughs> is ideal for internal sewing. That's internal sewing only. Have the insect bite across the incision, and all wound. Then snip off its head at the neck, and the jaws will remain tightly closed. It is found a successful poultice to be green bread, salt, garlic, and honey. Any wool, cloth, or bark can be used as a wound dressing <coughs> in conjunction with candle wax, pitch, and fat, although wisdom is assured if a drain wick is added. To stop blood wastage, use cautery with oil and pitch, very hot or very cold water, boiling oil, forceps, or alum. A lot of these cures they complicated the first injury by giving heaps to it with something else, like a, to stop blood, <coughs> they would tip boiling water all over the wound, which would then create two pretty nasty situations. Um, if I could just come back to those big black ants, they're, not in, they're only in the hotter countries of the world, 
They did use them very successfully. And what they didn't know when they were using them is that they give off folic acid, don't you? Formic, formic acid, and that was a mass curative right there and then. They didn't know what they were doing, but it was working for them. Yeah. Uh, childbirth is well cared for by women trained in this matter who should have long fingers and short fingernails. <laughs> Oh. But should the child die, to save the mother's life, remove it quickly with a traction hook. An enema is most suitably achieved by using a hollow cow horn and warm water. We still do it today without the cow horn. Uh, fractures are of a common nature, and believe me, they really work. Apply traction by drawing by hand, using a wheel knife, and large stave. That's simply a wheel with a hub, that's the hub of the wheel, and a long thing like half a quarter stave. Use traction. Same as they do today. Um, same basic result. Uh, large stave. With leather thonging or by windlass. They use lots of windlasses to get traction on uh, uh, the, the major fractures. Treat wound if ever, then bandage prolifically using starch, resin, or pitch to stiffen. Warm balls done, or dog's brains wrapped in wool. If the fracture will not reduce, cut a notch in the bone. Now listen carefully to this. If the fracture will not reduce, that means come back to normal, cut a notch in the bone, and use a stone mason's metal bar as a lever. So you're complicating complications there beyond belief. Uh, imagine having a stone mason's metal bar shoved in you, the good part of the bone, and the other one leave it away from it like that, while there's a massive great wound. Um, wooden splints and untreated wool can prove worthy for immobilisation. Fresh wine applied to wool and linen splints, particularly in a hot climb, will stop the skin from drying. They have that very problem today in hospitals. Bed sores. To treat dislocation of the spine, lay the patient on the table, attach a large plank horizontally to a nearby wall. Right? Could you just uh, pretend, stand over there, Billy, and just pretend you're laying on a table. You just bend in half, facing that way. Right? This plank would come out across like about an eight feet two or something, and they would jump up and down on the other end to like a chiropractor does today. <laughs> but it, they obviously had success because it was done for a long time. The Arabs were particularly into that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> heavy weights can be attached to rope and hung over the end of the bed to increase uh, and hold steady traction. They do that again today in certain things now. They don't use bother with it. But a countering windlass, so if you've got something pulling in this direction on the patient, you've got to have a countering windlass, windlass at the other end, uh, or what they call a groin pole, which stops you going as well. I prefer the windlass at the other end. Uh, lithotomy uh, is best left to the itinerant, that means bladder stone removal, is best left to the itinerant men with this specialised knowledge. But if you need to operate, use a dilator or speculum in the anus, then place finger in and press forward, attempting to crush stones. Now, at first that didn't make a lot of sense, but probably what they forgot to put in the book was that you have to come from the other direction from the outside as well. There's no good pushing in that direction against a major organ. You're going to crush anything, unless you put two fingers in and try and crush that one. Because bladder stones were a real problem in those days, particularly in the hot areas. They'd perspire and lose amazing amounts of uh, uh, body fluid, and it wasn't being replaced. So all these uh, countermeasures, the body functions set up countermeasures to stop it, and they turn into bladder and gall and whatever stones. Yeah. Um, if this failed, make an incision in the perineum and bladder, then remove stones and or crush with forces. Uh, retraction of foreign bodies, have the patient placed in the same position for removal of lance, spear, arrow, male link, etc., as that for which it entered. 
That does make a lot of sense. In other words, if you've got a spear in your bum while you're bending over, keep the patient in that position until you can sort of... <laughs> because if you start turning the patient other ways, it's going to start with that much steel inside, it's going to start affecting other organs. Uh, a suitable drink for internal wounds is wine, oil, honey, comfrey, ale and yeast. If an object cannot be removed without great damage, allow it to remain. Many a good man has lived long with internal accoutrement. Uh, today, even, I know many people have bullets in their head, close to their brain, they're too, too risky to pull out. Uh, diagnosis is assisted not only by observation and questioning, but by urine study and placing drops of blood on water. If the drops of blood float, it's infected. But should they sink, the blood is to be considered pure. Don't forget I'm talking about medieval medicine. That's, that's just not on. That's, that's somebody's thoughts rather than the true fact. Uh, further information can be obtained from the patient by placing in a public place so that all passing can discuss his own. <laughs> right. That's how it sounds. If you get crooked, you get... That's a good thing. This is in some area. Right. 3,000. Right. right. If you get crooked, you go to the person who you're closest to and say, listen, have you ever had a, this, whatever? And you discuss it, and then the next door neighbor, and everyone gets it on that. It's virtually the same today. Uh, but it makes a lot of sense, because a lot of communication would have been passed at that, whatever, I said, public square or Should a pregnant woman walk slowly and have hollow eyes, she will give birth to a boy. If she walks fast and has swollen eyes, a girl will eventuate. eventuate. Also, if she chooses a rose, it will be a girl. But beware of a pregnant woman who likes nuts and fresh fruit. They will present mentally affected offspring. <laughs> Also, those who eat the meat, their babies will be deformed. <laughs> blood and purges achieve the following. They make the mind sincere, purge the brain, reform the bladder, warm the marrow, open the hearing, check tears, remove nausea, benefit the stomach, invite digestion, evoke the voice, build up the senses, move the bowel, enrich sleep, remove anxiety and nourish good health. And you see why they are so heavy into bloodletting and leaching. Mm. Uh, for leprosy, Good God, if we'd only known this, we'd have cured it years ago. Rub goat's urine, honey, and salt on the affected area. Mm. Mm. Uh, for headache, and just imagine this, those with a good imagination, get right on the act here. Bind a new goat's cheese on your head. Right. Uh, for gout, you can scarify the area for gout. Scarifying is a very nasty, nasty form of multiple incisions in the area. It's a thing like that that makes multiple incisions. A very nasty. Uh, for sore feet, I'm oh, sorry, sore feet are the scourge of the weary traveller. Rub with salt and vinegar, then apply fat to seal. And it makes, <laughs> it makes a bloody lot of sense, actually. All right, we're nearly there. For seasickness, this can be alleviated by consuming lemon juice, aromatic seeds, and sweets. So what did they used to give you on a plane up until about 10 years ago? Lollies. Because the action of the jaw uh, causes many things to physiologically to happen yeah, and settles the old tummy, etc., etc., etc. Lethargy, which most of you will be suffering from at about 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> can be overcome by placing a poultice of pigeon's droppings. <laughs> and if anyone who's looking at the bit in the morning, this is what's going to happen to you. <laughs> a poultice of pigeon droppings and honey to the back of the head. <laughs> right. Insomnia can be cured by placing a goat's horn under the head or by hanging the heart of an owl and a robin above the patient. That's obviously when you're asleep. Uh, right? Uh, baldness. <laughs> Place fresh juice on the nose. Brother. Place fresh juice on the nose. 
and the hair will be sure to grow. Fresh nasturtiums. Don't you that? That's the sweet one. Crash. Nasturtium. Crash. C-R-E-W-S. You find it in rivers and things. Yeah. Right. But on the note, to cure the pet. Anyway. Scurf and dandruff are simple to cure. Take the cress seed and grind, I'm sorry, and grind with goose grease and apply. Of course it's going to work. It really is. It's not going to cure it forever, but it's going to work. Any grease in your hair will stop dandruff for you. When you get dandruff on your shoes, you're going to start wearing it. Warts and boils are also simple to cure. Take cress seed and grind with yeast and apply direct. Facial blemishes are removed with bull's blood. I reckon you'd freak out so much having bull's blood that they would bloody well disappear. <laughs> uh, nose bleed will be stopped by pinching the nostrils. Probably one of the truest things that's on this that is applicable today. In fact, it went out for almost 100 years and they, three or four years ago, as an ambulance uh, first aid form of treatment, they brought back that very thing that I just... <laughs> Lunacy! <laughs> he is beaten by wrapping clove wart in a red cloth <laughs> around the throat. <laughs> around the throat of the patient in April and October. All right, the April and October is irrelevant. But by Jesus, that red cloth not. Yeah. Colour therapy? It is big. Yeah. Should a man inadvertently swallow a male worm? <laughs> No Sing a song in his right ear. <laughs> Should the worm be female? Sing in the patient's left ear. Uh, the question is how do you determine? They're right. <laughs> Smallpox will be cured by wrapping the patient in red colours. I'll leave you that up to your own decision. It works. Instruments and accessories that are necessary for the. I'll come back to that when we do that. Right. Because you don't want a whole bloody list of what they took in the field, the hospital, and on ships with them. Okay. Cupping glasses or horns must be used to suck up body tissue to draw out bruising and foul weeping sores. Makes a lot of sense. Bloodletting can be facilitated by this method. Now, of course, as you know, if you cut yourself, it will stop bleeding under normal circumstances. So to keep the bloodletting going, they have to use these things like a basically like a, a glass that you drink from, upside down, to keep the wound open. Yeah. And they simply did it by, I guess, sucking, because they used to put heat on them, which caused apparently a vacuum inside to give it heaps every now and again to keep the blood. Isn't it funny, we spend all here, we, we see a bit of blood and we all want to stop it. They were right into keeping it going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, beware of strong wine. <laughs> as it will dissolve the liver, as it will dissolve the liver, wrote King Seward of Norway in 1116 AD. He was also a renowned surgeon who completed many experiments in dissolving peach livers with wine. <laughs> yes, he did. I was there. And, uh, <laughs> and he, he backed it up with autopsies. Now, what he was referring to, of course, was not the watered down varieties that we know about today, he was talking about the very strong things they used to make in those days, which would dissolve the teaspoon. Right. Bleeding can be stopped, <laughs> listen to this, this is the final thing too, but have a particularly Jim there, this will, and brothers and nurse too, work on this one, and think of your time spans, right? Bleeding can be stopped by mixing charcoal or soot with some of the escaping blood. Dry it on a hot stone, then rub it into, the du into dust, lay on the wound and tie strongly. How long is it going to take you to do all that? It well, it'll stop. So I guess the last thing is the main thing, tie it, which is what we all do today. Or on the road anyway, what people do in hospitals because of much more sophisticated. But so, um, now if I could just uh, have Bill for a sec. A kicky. Uh, I'd like to just demonstrate very quickly. That is very obvious by its mere presence what it is. It's an arm splint from medieval times. 
the arm was simply put on this area here and was tied on a false boss. This was hung around the neck for other obvious reasons. Okay? They did use a lot of splinters in those days. This was the style of uh, field. In the style of the field packs they used to carry only they were much bigger. It was like a tool roll, a modern tool roll. In actual fact, the maker is Billy right here. He made some of the most beautiful instruments. Uh, obviously suturing needles. Dentistry tools. The levers, remember the levers I was talking about for levering teeth out and pulling them out the side, etc. Uh, a small scalpel and smaller instruments which we won't go into only because it's too boring and complicated. And Billy actually made that as a set for the medieval hospital. <laughs> which is set up in Tassie at the moment. Uh, that's a knife Dave made many years ago, and not for the purpose of being a hospital knife, but it is a perfect example of a knife that would have been used in surgery. The cranial saw, which we've already looked at. All right, you do your trephining, if it doesn't break. All right, then you follow up those holes with this saw. It's on that angle for obvious reasons. Okay. A scalpel, Roman, basically a Roman scalpel. But of course, medicine went into a bit of a decline and then re-rose again. The Normans really uh, made the upsurge.